everybody. I'm Harvey Mansfield, and this is the program on constitutional government. Uh, welcome to our first Zoom meeting online for the PCG. Our guest today is Stephen Rosen, and he's going to talk on the topic of America first, question mark, choice and necessity in American security policy. Stephen Rosen is the Conab Professor of National Security and Military Affairs at Harvard. He's written books, Winning the Next War, India and Its Armies, and War and Human Nature. He's uh, worked at the Pentagon and the Office of Net Assessment, and he's been on the National Security Council in the White House. So that's his governmental experience. I would say two things of him, especially. He's a wonderful teacher. He's taught the course War and Politics at Harvard for some years now, and he's won many awards for, well, three war awards for his teaching. That's a lot. And second, uh, he's a wise head. Even in a great and diverse and populous country like ours, there's always a shortage of people with wiser heads, and Steve Rosen is one of those. So, Steve. Harvey, thank you for that generous introduction. I will try to live up to it. Uh, I want to say how much of an honor it is to be asked by you to present at your seminar, uh, and how much I miss being together with you in prison. Uh, uh, Harvey, I miss the sandwiches and beer that you bring, and Anna, you always bring us cake, uh, which I always eat with delight, uh, and all these video conferences may be okay, uh, but I look forward to the day when we can sit down and, and have lunch together uh, and enjoy each other's company in person. Uh, I'd like to thank also all the uh, old friends, as the Chinese would say, that I could see on the list of participants. Uh, but let me get to the subject. Uh, we, the United States, the people of the United States, all, all of us here know that the United States faces serious external threats. Uh, we face a tyrannical expansionist China, uh, which may have more economic power than the United States does uh, in some years. We face a Russia, uh, which has thousands of nuclear weapons and 100 years of experience honing the arts of clandestine warfare and political subversion. Uh, we face militant Islam, both Sunni and Shiite, which is still active in the world, even though we have got tired of fighting it. The question is not whether or not the United States faces major external th threats. The question is, what ought we to do about it? The question I will be addressing today is, should the United States defend the United States by fighting abroad, as we have done since the end of World War II? Or should we defend the United States by defending the United States, by responding only to attacks on the United States or threats of attack on the United States? This could be called, and most people I think would agree, a, a policy of America first, which has uh, historical roots and antecedents, uh, which are questionable and, and which we'll debate. But there are reasons why I think at this moment in time, we need to ask ourselves whether the United States can continue its policy of uh, 75 years of defending the United States by fighting abroad or by being willing and prepared to fight abroad, or should the United States defend the United States uh, at home? Uh, by responding to attacks on ourselves. What do we want from our national security policy? Well, it's clear we want to protect our liberties and our well-being, but the question is how best to do that. Beginning in World War I, the United States tried the policy of defending itself by fighting abroad on behalf of allies in Europe to prevent the expansion of German militaristic despotism, which we feared could ultimately threaten the United States. The lesson that the United States drew from the immediate aftermath of World War I, however, was that that was a mistake, uh, that the United States had not improved its well-being 
or increased its security by fighting on behalf of the French and the British against Germany. Uh, this was the moment at which the United States first adopted the policy of America first as championed by Charles Lindbergh. But the experiences that followed the rise of Hitler and Japanese militaristic imperialism discredited the idea of America first because the policy of America first appeared to lead to the rise of Hitler and to Pearl Harbor and to direct attacks on the United States. The lesson that was drawn was that the United States failed to defend itself by adopting a policy of military withdrawal from Asia and from Europe. And from then on, the United States had to be willing to commit itself to the defense of allies and interests around, around the world, far from the United States, to prevent the rise and expansion of tyranny, which ultimately would come to attack the United States. People of my generation, of Harvey's generation, grew up assuming that this was a fixed truth. The best way to defend the United States was to fight abroad to do what is called in technical military terms, power projection, fighting far from the United States so as not to have to fight near to the United States. This is the strategy and this is the military policy we currently have, but it is becoming increasingly difficult to sustain. I teach undergraduates, as do many of you, the undergraduates we teach, in fact, those under the age of 50 have no memory of the 1930s. They have no direct memory of the Cold War. And what they have been taught in classrooms was that the Cold War was a terrible mistake. The Soviet Union was not really expansionist. In our anti-communist fervor, we imagined threats that did not exist. We spent exorbitant amounts of money on military capabilities, which were not only unnecessary, but dangerous. They led to arms races that could have led to World War III by mistake. The United States and the Soviet Union in this uh, version of history were apes on a treadmill, racing feverishly, but making no progress relative to each other or towards any reasonably uh, acceptable goal. This is the way the wars of the Cold War were looked, looked at by this generation. The wars in Vietnam was a catastrophe. And the wars that the generation younger than me saw for themselves in Iraq and Afghanistan appeared to be pointless at best, destructive of world order at worst, and destructive of the American national project. It created a national security state. The global war on terrorism created not security for the United States, but massive American intrusion into American private liberties. Uh, violations uh, of the spirit of ethnic toleration by demonizing Arabs. The wars in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan were not only unnecessary, they were destructive of our own security and spirit. The policy of committing to fight far from the United States is also more difficult, I will be discussing more in more detail, because of material factors. I will be arguing that the spread of technologies, both nuclear and non-nuclear, make it harder for the United States to project power in the ways that we did in the past. And finally, America is clearly divided. Internally, there is no consensus in the United States that we ought to fight on behalf of our NATO allies or our, European, or our Asian allies. Uh, this is the uh, spirit that Donald Trump tapped into by reviving the slogan of America first. We were chumps, he said, suckers lured into fighting other people's battles while they looted our national treasure and stole our jobs. We should put America first. But it's not only Donald Trump who believes that the United States might be better off if it no longer fought abroad on behalf of allies. The left of America, for different reasons, think the United States in fighting abroad is a force for evil, a source of discord, a destroyer of world order. And so the, the left, for its own reasons, thinks the United States ought to adopt a much more constrained military policy, which winds up looking more like America first than anything else. What, is the alter what are the alternatives from which we can choose? 
The alternatives I will be discussing are continuing our existing military policies or adopting a policy of military withdrawal, focusing on dealing with threats that are threats to the United States itself. This, in fact, is the older and more traditional American foreign policy that was dominant in the 18th and 19th centuries when America was weaker relative to the rest of the world than it was after the end of World War II. The idea in those periods was that American national unity, internal unity, was the most important factor that would safeguard American national security. Internal unity not military power was, met, was, was what made America safe. And to unite America, this argument posited, the United States should fight only wars of necessity and should eschew wars of choice. Wars of necessity would unite the United States, wars of choice would divide the United States. This was important, more important, as I said, when the United States was weaker and had to actually worry about attacks from abroad. The first and some and most clear statement of this can be found by, written by Alexander Hamilton, who wrote a memo to George Washington at the time of the French Revolution when there was bitter debate within the United States about whether the United States should take the side of democratic revolutionary France or should obey the dictates of the balance of power and be, have good relations with Great Britain. This was something that bitterly divided the United States. Hamilton wrote a memo to Washington, which ultimately resulted in the Jay mission, in which he said, the first thing that America must do is secure its own internal unity. The way to get internal national unity, he wrote to Washington, uh, was to avoid wars of choice. Unanimity among ourselves is the most important requirement, he wrote and quote, can only be secured by it being manifest that if war ensues, it was inevitable by any other course of action. Only if war could not be avoided by another course of action should you go to war. Wars to, go to, to defend ourselves when we have no choice, when we are directly threatened or attacked, are wars of necessity. They unite the country, but they concede the initiative to the enemy. If the enemy attacks us, it means the enemy is able to attack when he is prepared, where he chooses, and perhaps before we are prepared. This was the problem identified by George Kennan in his works on American foreign policy. America, he said, was too prone only to fight wars of necessity. We waited until we were hit over the head by an enemy and then responded, by which time often it could be too late. The question we face now, since we are more powerful, we could fight wars of choice abroad, we can fight wars of choice abroad, or we could choose to fight only wars of necessity, wars to fight our, to protect ourselves after we are threatened or attacked. What, when we decide what we should do, we must look around the world at the world as it is. Necessity is created by facts external to ourselves and internal to ourselves. What are the realities that we must face? The first reality is the spread of modern non-nuclear technology has made it easier for countries to defend themselves against countries that are projecting power and harder and more costly to project power. To make it very simple, the defense has grown stronger because countries now can use information technology to develop what we call precision strike weapons. Anything that is big, anything that is fixed, uh, can be struck. Anything that can be struck can be destroyed. How does America project power abroad? By means of big 90,000 ton chunks of steel aircraft carriers, which are easy to find, easy to locate, and easy to destroy or we defend the United States from big military bases abroad, of which there are very few, and all of which are within range of precision strike weapons now in the possession, not only of China, but of lesser powers such as Iran as well. The, the material factors of war have made it harder for the United States to project military power abroad if it uses the means which it has used up until now, 
big military platforms like aircraft carriers, uh, military bases, air, manned bombers like the B-52 and so forth. The second fact that has changed in the external world is that the United States is vulnerable to attack even if it does not go abroad. Cyber warfare, digital warfare, has made it possible for adversaries to interfere with such things as our power grids, to make it hard for the United States economy to operate in ways that support American military operations. This too can be used to thwart American power projection and in fact, the Chinese communist military writers uh, on this subject who have been studied by Jacqueline Deal have said the way to stop American power projection is to attack it at its source, to make sure it can never get across the Pacific by making sure that it can never leave San Diego Harbor. Power projection has become more difficult because of the advent of cyber warfare. And nuclear weapons have spread. Nuclear weapons have existed for many decades. The new, Pakistan and North Korea now have them. Countries that have nuclear weapons can be and have been attacked. Israel has been attacked. China has been attacked in 1969 after it acquired nuclear weapons. Pakistan has been attacked by India after it acquired nuclear weapons. But those attacks have been very, very limited. Countries are very cautious when using military power against countries that have nuclear weapons, and rightly so. The United States until now has projected power, military power, against countries that do not have nuclear weapons. We've had the freedom to bomb North Vietnam, Iraq, and other countries to achieve our military purposes, and that will become harder and harder to do as more countries grow nearer to having nuclear weapons and have nuclear weapons. Ambassador Edelman full well knows the problems associated with presidential decision-making when faced with possible nuclear powers. And finally, a new reality has emerged internally to which I have referred already. There is a reduction in the willingness of the American people to commit itself to defend friends abroad in the Middle East. We are clearly grown weary of fighting on behalf of staunch allies in the Middle East, even the Kurds. And so uh, we have grown weary of fighting on behalf of Europeans. People have made much of President Trump's decision to withdraw troops, American troops, from Germany. Uh, they would do, would do well to recall that President Obama withdrew two armored brigades from Germany for the same reasons, basically, that President Trump did. Didn't think they were necessary, didn't think that Germany was carrying its weight. The United States is now called upon possibly to fight on behalf of Japan. For what? For the Senkaku Islands, which many Americans regard as rocks, rock formations which sometimes stick out above the East China Sea, but much of the time may be submerged, or Taiwan. And people ask themselves, do you really want to fight China on behalf of Taiwan? It will be long, difficult, bloody, and, and, and for what? So there are powerful material forces and powerful political forces that call into question whether the United States will continue to maintain the policies of the fighting abroad to defend the United States at home. What are our choices given those realities? The first choice might be called the conservative choice, conservative with a small c. We will maintain our tradition of fighting abroad to defend themselves, but we will change the means by which we do it. Technology has changed and has made power projection the way we used to do it too hard. We will change our technology. And that in fact is already well underway. The United States military is responding to the introduction of precision strike weapons in the inventories of our enemies by moving quickly now uh, to unmanned autonomous or robotic weapons that are cheaper than manned platforms and which don't involve the risk of losing personnel because they are unmanned. The United States Air Force is moving, one might say, too quickly or too slowly to small unmanned airplanes, which have the capabilities of fighter airplanes, but which cost perhaps two or 3% of the cost of an F-35. Thousands of these airplanes could be built uh, and they would overwhelm 
the capabilities which our adversaries have by means of precision strike capabilities. Cheap, small, unmanned missiles, airplanes can, uh, can be used. The same logic and technology is being applied to naval warfare. The United States Navy is considering proposals to massively expand the United States fleet, not by building manned ships, but by building what are called optionally manned ships or unmanned ships large ships that are unmanned that carry smaller ships that are unmanned, which can create swarms of small ships that can overwhelm the, def the defenses of countries against which we wish to project power. Robotic warfare is being developed for warfare on land. All of this overcomes or could overcome some of the material obstacles to maintaining our current posture of projecting military power abroad. Instead of using big fixed air bases, we will have long ranged bombers which can operate from the United States. Uh, we will uh, use massively distributed constellations of satellites so that we are not vulnerable to anti-satellite attacks because instead of having two or three big expensive satellites to provide us with information or communications, we will have hundreds or thousands of satellites. This whole perspective is changing the American military. The chief of staff of the United States Air Force has recently said, the United States must plan for a war in which the United States itself will be attacked. And we must therefore assume that, that we have, we will build, we will, we must bear, therefore build defenses and assume that we will fight in the United States to defend ourselves when we fight abroad. We are now building fighters in a fraction amount of the amount of time that it used to take us so that we can stay ahead of the adversaries in our technological capabilities. And in cyber defenses, we are adopting a strategy of hunt forward and persistent engagement. We'll use cyber warfare to attack adversaries before they can use cyber warfare to attack us. And all of this will maintain our ability to conduct warfare as we have conducted by fighting far from the United States abroad. Sounds good. Should we, should we maintain this policy? There are questions. First of all, it's costly. These new unmanned systems are cheaper than manned systems, but they're not cheap in absolute terms. Second is geography. It's always going to be easier and cheaper to fight closer to where you are, live than to fight far away. No matter how good our technology is, China will always find it easier to find, fight closer to China than it is for us to fight 10,000 miles away from the United States. The United States will have to defend itself even if it wants to fight abroad and defending ourselves at home will take money, will be costly, and that money will not be available to buy forces that can fight far from home. Perhaps most challenging is the fact that China will have an economy bigger than that of the United States on current projections in about 10 years. Now, these projections are always subject to question. Uh, things could change, but the, so chi the economy of China now, today, is 70% that of the United States. It is worth recalling that the economy of the Soviet Union at its peak was probably only 35 to 40% of the size of the American economy. The United States has had the luxury of fighting or competing with countries that were economically inferior to it. China is not as inferior to the United States as the Soviet Union was, and is quite possibly going to be as strong as or stronger than the United States in terms of gross national product. And technologically, by stealing American technology, they have managed to keep close to the United States in qualitative capabilities. The idea that the United States will be able to fight China close to China, when China is as rich as the United States, is close to to equal to the United States in technological capabilities is at least questionable. And finally, there is this issue of whether Americans are happy or willing, not happy, but are willing to sustain the costs of fighting China close to China. Funda the most fundamental question that Americans are asking themselves is why should the United States defend Taiwan? Why should the United States defend Japan or even less India? 
the link between the security of Taiwan, Japan, and India may be real, but it is not obvious to Americans. Well, what is the link between the security of Taiwan, Japan, and India, and the security of the United States? The first argument is it's economics. If China denies the United States the ability to trade with Japan, Taiwan, and India, the United States economy will be crippled. Well, this may be true, but it is not obvious. Total American foreign trade, exports plus imports, is about 20% of the total US gross domestic product. US exports and imports to Asia is about 20% of our total foreign trade. 20% of 20% is 4%. If we lose access to Asia, we will lose 4% We'll, we'll, we'll lose trade equal to 4% of our GDP. 4% of our GDP is not nothing, but is it worth fighting a war over? Well, okay, no, the, the argument is more uh, subtle than that. If China gained control of the technology of Japan and Taiwan, it could close the technological gap with the United States and the United States would not be secure because it would not have its technological superiority with which it counters the superiority that China has in numbers, in mass. But is, the, is it necessary for China to conquer Taiwan and, and Japan in order to gain access to their technology? It could be argued it's getting access to their technology today. It's not clear, therefore, whether the United States has to fight to make sure that China does not have the technological values, uh, assets that are owned by Taiwan and Japan. Again, at the end of the day, that it may turn out to be true that China will be stronger if, it, if it's able to dominate Japan and Korea and Taiwan, but it's not obvious how it will. But the core argument, the fundamental argument why the United States defends West Europe, why the United States defends Japan, defends Taiwan, is shared values. These are democratic systems. As a democratic state, as the strongest democratic state, we have an obligation to defend our fellow democracies. Not fighting for them would diminish us. The argument that shared values should inform American foreign policy is old, but it used in, in the past not to lead to the conclusion that the United States should fight abroad to defend allies. This, was, this proposition was most famously explicated by John Quincy Adams in 1821 in his famous uh, query about whether the United States should seek monsters abroad to fight. Wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will her heart, her benedictions, and her prayers be. But she goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. The United States is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. The question is, why? Why be the champion only of your own? The answer that Adams gives is interesting. The United States well knows that by once enlisting under other banners than her own, were they even the banners of foreign independence, she would involve herself beyond the power of extrication in all the wars of interest and intrigue, of individual avarice, envy, and ambition, which assume the colors and usurp the standard of freedom. The fundamental maxim of American policy would insensibly change from liberty to force. The United States might then become the dictatress of the world, but she would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. The dictum that a democracies best protect their own democracy by fighting only defensive wars is as old as Thucydides and the statement by Pericles to the Athenian people to fight only to defend what they had and not to expand their empire. Uh, it is as old as Hamilton's injunctions to Washington or Lincoln's strategy of deliberately maneuvering and waiting so that the forces of the Union would not attack the forces of the rebellious states, but wait until the forces of the rebellion attack the North, thereby uniting the American people in defense of the Union. It was the strategy of Franklin Roosevelt to delay entry of the United States into World War II, 
until the United States itself was attacked because the United States in the 1930s was bitterly divided. The isolationist America first forces were very strong as they are today. Why does the United States have to fight abroad? People might ask today. If there are democracies abroad that are threatened, why don't we give them or enable them to acquire the capabilities that would allow them to defend themselves? These countries are rich. They have, they have technology of their own. Why can't, they, why can't Germany defend Germany? Why can't Germany, Japan defend Japan? This was not true in the immediate aftermath of World War II when Germany and Japan were destroyed by war, but it is certainly long since that those economies have fully recovered and gone beyond. In addition to that, it can be argued that by protecting the countries of West Europe, by guaranteeing their security, by protecting Japan and Taiwan, by guaranteeing their security, the United States has inculcated a psychology of dependence on the United States. Rather than the spirit of national patriotism, which looks to defend itself, as can be found, for example, in Israel, in Germany and, and Japan and Taiwan, the sentiment is the Americans will defend ourselves. What we do does not matter that much. This is what has been called the infantilization of our allies by overprotection by the United States. It's bad for them. They can defend themselves, they could defend themselves, by protecting them, we prevent them from emerging as mature adult nations. But of course, we could help them acquire the ability to defend themselves. And that would require a change in American policies. The United States has deliberately chosen not to transfer capabilities or not even to permit the acquisition of capabilities by friendly democracies that would allow them to defend themselves. The United States could extend certain non-nuclear military capabilities for precision strike, which would increase the defensive capabilities of our friends, just as the flow of that technology has increased the defensive capabilities of our enemies. And that, in fact, is in progress, both in Japan and in Taiwan, and is a positive development. But there are still other capabilities, which are non-nuclear, which the United States does not transfer. We don't sell nuclear submarines to our allies, though nuclear submarines are the most powerful maritime weapon that we have. We don't transfer long range manned bombers to our friends, even Israel. Although the joke has been made, we should sell the Israelis B-52s. If you want Japan to have the capability to retaliate against an attack by China on Japan, it needs long range weapons. Well, the United States might help instead of standing athwart. The Japanese desire to, uh, the Japanese requirement for such weapons. And finally, the United States might even consider transferring or not blocking the acquisition of nuclear weapons technology. Lest this be thought of as heretical, it was the de facto policy of the United States during the administration of Dwight Eisenhower when American nuclear weapons were put into the hands of the German Air Force. German airplanes with German pilots had American nuclear weapons on them. And this was a deliberate decision by Eisenhower to give the Germans the capability to retaliate with nuclear weapons against a possible Soviet attack, because this was the most credible and most powerful deterrent that Germany could have to deter the Soviet Union. And Eisenhower did this in the hopes that this would make possible the withdrawal of American military forces from Germany, which he regarded as adding to the cost of American defenses, crippling the United States in its long run economic competition with the Soviet Union. Sounds good. Why not encourage the military development of, our fr of friendly countries around the world? Well, let's ask ourselves, would a world in which other countries have more military power be a world in which the United States is safer? Other countries could change their objectives and their political system. They might do things with those capabilities that the United States does not like. There's no guarantee that German nationalism or Japanese nationalism will always be benign. And there's the observation from political science, this is the one political science observation I, I will allow myself to make. Multipolar systems are more complicated than bipolar systems. 
they can generate all kinds of unforeseen and unintended consequences. Multipolar uh, international systems can have rapidly reforming coalitions, which create threats where threats did not exist the day before yesterday. It complicates American defense planning to encourage the uh, increase in military power of multiple countries around the world. But we still need to think about the policy of aiding other countries in defending themselves because the United States will not, will have great difficulty in spending all the money that it may need to spend in order to be able to maintain its military posture ab abroad. The United States has to spend money to defend itself against cyber attack. The United States is beginning to spend money to defend itself against cruise missile attacks, which are emerging in Russian, Chinese, and other hands. That's expensive. Larger attacks on the United States uh, might be deterred, might be defended against by deterrence. We will build the capabilities to retaliate against countries that attack us by nuclear, non-nuclear, and cyber means. This is a new area for the United States, which I think well deserves exploration. China has four times, has three times, four times the population of the United States may have an economy larger than the United States, but it is a tyranny. And tyrannies relative to democracies have asymmetric internal vulnerabilities. As Xenophon teaches us, a tyrant is most at war when he is at home. He is always at war with his own people because he rules according to his will and against the laws. This creates the possibility that external powers could do things to make the tyrant fearful that if he attacks us, we will enable his own people to attack him. This is a policy which would be new, it would have risks, but because of the particular asymmetry, asymmetry in regime types, I think is well worth exploring. Let me conclude. I've tried to give you an even handed exposition of two policies, defending America abroad or defending America only when America itself is threatened or attacked. I've talked of this in terms of the outcomes. Could we win? Could we lose? How much would it cost? Where would we, what would we have to buy? Let me now talk of these two policies in terms of their consequences for the American national spirit. After all, John Quincy Adams argued against uh, military wars abroad because of, its, uh, of the possible damage it would do to the American national spirit. Would a focus on the defense of only the United States, a new version of America first, be good or bad for the American spirit? Some people who would advocate America first would turn an old argument on its head. It used to be argued that if you adopted a policy of America first, of defending only the United States, you would turn America into a garrison state. Professor Friedberg has written a book which explores the, that phrase. A garrison state, the argument was, uh, argument was, was bad. A garrison state is a militarized state. It's a state in which it's, high, it's nationalist. It's less cosmopolitan. It's, a, a, it's an America where it's America against foreigners. Well, some people who are hostile to the idea of a cosmopolitan America, some people who argued the United States would be better off if there was more nationalism and more national devotion to nation and less to abstract principles. Maybe that's a country which is more like an old fashioned country, a more old fashioned patriotic country. Maybe America first is a desirable policy because it makes us less cosmopolitan. On the other hand, a, a policy of committing the United States to fight abroad would by necessity be a more cosmopolitan foreign policy. We, we fight on behalf of others, even if they're not Americans. Because what matters is not whether they're Americans or not, what matters is whether they share our principles or, and values or not. That's an America which is not just, I'll take care of myself and tough luck, Charlie, 
if you're not an American. It's a policy of defending principles, which is a universal, not a national loyalty. Do we adopt America first because it creates an America which is more nationalistic, which is what we want? Or do we adopt a policy of fighting abroad because fighting abroad is fighting on behalf of liberties of others, which makes us a more international and cosmopolitan nation. And that's what we want. We are at a moment in American history where American foreign policy is really up for grabs. It's not clear which direction we'll go. The argument I've tried to present is the United States has the choice of going either way. And my concluding argument is, is I think that choice ought to be informed not only by external realities, but by a decision about what kind of country we want America to be. We want to be masters of our own spirit, and therefore we must choose what kind of spirit we wish to have. Let me stop. Well, that's, uh, that was quite wonderful, Steve. So I, um, I want to start with a first question, and, um, which is a four-letter word, Iraq. Um, what is your judgment on our experience in um, Iraq? It seems that uh, that experience has left a bad taste in our uh, mouths. And um, as nobody defends it, um, all those who were in favor of it, like me, maybe like you, like Joe Biden, uh, don't talk about it anymore. Um, Iraq seems to be an example uh, the ruling example of our foreign policy or our thinking about foreign policy in the way that you said uh, uh, the experience of, of appeasement of Hitler uh, was, was once upon a time the ruling example of how to live uh, a foreign policy. Yes. So uh, um, what do we think about uh, Iraq? And it's also the case, I think, that uh, people often don't adopt a positive goal so much as a negative goal. Something that they don't want to do um, can crowd out their thinking of what they ought to be doing. Yes, as uh, it's only slightly unfair to characterize the Obama presidency as having had that policy. Don't do stupid stuff was their mantra. Uh, put somewhat more earthily. Uh, but it's not, enough, it's not enough, as they themselves found. So what do I think about Iraq? I will start by saying, what do I think about Iraq retrospectively about the last 10 years? And what do I think about Iraq now, which is obviously uh, more problematic? The war in Iraq, I regarded as necessary. Uh, people forget that Saddam Hussein uh, attacked and invaded Iran, attacked and invaded Kuwait. And when we were preparing for the 2003 war, uh, was again preparing his military forces for further regional expansion. He was uh, someone who could not be changed, who could not be appeased. Uh, he had the wealth of the oil of Iraq, and he would use that to expand his, his domain. Uh, it, it was, he was fundamentally uh, incompatible with a peaceful, stable Middle Eastern order, which I regarded as being in the interest of the United States and the rest of the world. The weapons of mass destruction was added to that threat, but it was not the only reason to be worried about Saddam Hussein. I regard the conduct of the war of, by the United States in Iraq as being as uh, necessary. We had to do it, I think. We could have won. And I'll tell you specifically what I mean by that. By 2009 or 10, American policies, which are loosely referred to as the surge, transformed the American position in Iraq by making local alliances uh, with the uh, uh, Iraqi uh, Sunni leaders, uh, by building up their forces, by fighting more intelligent wars of counterinsurgency by protecting, by doing more to protect the Iraqi people against uh, terrorists, we reduced the level of violence in Iraq to levels which it had not seen since uh, before uh, Saddam Hussein. 
In 2010, Iraq was a peaceful society which was on the road to recovering its well-being and welfare and to becoming a increasingly democratic participant in the uh, Middle Eastern world order. But by that time, the American people had grown weary of uh, fighting and be being in Iraq and were susceptible to appeals to let's end these endless wars, which is what the Obama administration tried to do. The United States could have won the war in Iraq because by 2010, it actually had come close to it. I hadn't gotten all the way yet. If you want to follow up on this, there's a wonderful book by a British left-wing peace activist, whose name is Emma Skye, called The Unraveling. She went to Iraq because she was fundamentally opposed to American military policies in Iraq. She saw what the United States was doing in Iraq, and she became one of the biggest advocates and defenders of the American army in Iraq, because it was helping the Iraqi people. It was building a stable, peaceful society. And then she writes the book about how all of that was thrown away, the unraveling. So how do I look at Iraq? It was a war which the United States could have won because it almost did, but then it threw it away. The lesson is one of the need for perseverance and consistency. Or more critically, if the United States had done in 2004 in his military policies, what it did in Iraq in 2007, maybe the American people wouldn't have grown tired of the American role in Iraq and wouldn't have called for our immediate withdrawal. So the fault is also on the George W. Bush administration for not shifting over to better policies of counterinsurgency, which generals like General Petraeus knew how to do and which were who they were implementing them in their narrow spheres of influence uh, up in the North. What do I think of Iraq today? I don't know enough about it, but once again, people, there seem to be some signs of progress towards a peace, more peaceful, stable society, because Iran has overplayed its hand. There is, uh, uh, Ambassador Edelman said this many times during the war, what will save Iraq is bourgeois nationalism. Having Iranians come in and dictate your country's policies is something which many Iraqis object to, even if they are Shiite. And so there are some tendencies that there is an emerging nationalist political movement in Iraq, which wants to build a legitimate national government, which safeguards its interest. Where that will go, I do not know. What should the United States do about it? That is dictated by necessity. There is no possibility that the United States will re-engage militarily uh, in Iraq. And therefore, to, to argue that we should, I think, is to whistle in the is to is to spit in the wind. It, it, it will do no good. Uh, so we didn't have to be where we are now, but here we are, and we have to make the best of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Jim. You may unmute yourself, Jim Hankins. All right. Yes, uh, I was. Thank you very much. First of all, for a very uh, interesting and a closely argued paper. Um, I was a little bit uh, alarmed or concerned when you started talking about the weaknesses of uh, tyranny or monarchy, uh, um, whether one should consider the Chinese state a tyranny. It certainly is, does tyrannical things, but all states do tyrannical things. We have quite a bit of tyranny going on at the state level at the moment in the United States. But my real concern with this is that two can play the game. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion lately about Chinese soft power, for example, in Australia, because some uh, pretty obvious efforts to undermine uh, the government in Australia have been exposed in the press. Um, I guess they're calling this sharp power now, the attempt to coerce and manipulate opinion abroad or, uh, and there's an even more, um, uh, let's say, insidious form of this where you try to undermine uh, an opponent's economy or social cohesion or military effectiveness by uh, various covert means. So my worry is that if we attempted such a, um, this sort of 
uh, move against China or, or Russia, that we would find ourselves on the receiving end as well. And we might not want to go down that route. Uh, James, that's an excellent question. It is informed by a desire for prudence and not to do things, with the, the longer term consequences of which we might uh, not be so happy with if we had thought about them at the beginning. I have two answers to your question. One is rhetorical and the, one, the other one is uh, more serious. The rhetorical answer to your question, the answer I would use to kind of win a debate is uh, they're already doing it to us. It's right. not as if we, if we refrain from intervening in their, in their political systems to increase public opposition to tyranny. It's not as if we, we refrain from that. They would refrain from interfering in our political systems. They're already interfering in our political systems and have been doing so for 20 years in the case of China or more, mm -hmm. using money, espionage, subversion, uh, threats. Um, it could get worse. Uh, well, I wonder to what extent our current uh, current uh, factionalism and partisanship, which is extreme, very extreme by historical standards, is being is being promoted by uh, outside powers that really have uh, uh, the kind of. Um, I'm very upset about the way the country is going now, and I wonder to what extent that might be the result of. Uh, of uh, external uh, in interference in our affairs. Uh, I am also not happy about the level of internal division in the United States now. I, I don't think it was, I'm, I'm sure it was not created by foreign powers. Uh, I am sure the foreign powers are exploiting it. One of the reasons why I chose to give this talk in this particular way is because I wanted to think about whether our choice of foreign policies might increase or decrease our internal political unity. The whole, the whole talk was we might want to consider unity as yeah. a national. Now, the, the serious answer to your question is one to which really I have to defer, defer to Harvey on. Which type of regime, republics or tyrannies, are, are more vulnerable uh, to conspiracies? Uh, Harvey, I use the word conspiracies deliberately because that's the word that Machiavelli uses in the longest chapter in his book, Discourses on Livy. And in that chapter, Machiavelli talks about the two forms of conspiracy to which diff the different regimes are vulnerable. Democracy, republics are vulnerable to conspiracies in which the great men of the democracies conspire uh, Tyrannies uh, are vulnerable to, uh, to conspiracies because they, the tyrant always has to suspect conspiracies. He knows that he is always at war with his own people. The one thing that you said that I would discuss uh, is there's, there's tyranny everywhere. And there's reason to say, okay, it's a matter of, the, of degree. But the, 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 the People's Republic of China is ruled by the Communist Party of China. The Communist Party of China says it is a dictatorship. It explicitly says we are telling the people of China to do. We have a dictatorship because the we are making the people of China do things they don't want to do. Otherwise, why would you need a dictatorship? In the United States political system, for all of its weaknesses, for all of its flaws, we still have elections. We still have the ability to shift national course by means of the law voting according to the law. Uh, we are not yet in the same position. Uh, we, we're not yet tyrannical. Uh, now, who would be hurt more if both sides engaged in political warfare? As I said, right now it's one-sided, but I am actually engaged in a multi-year effort to do a historical study of democratic attacks on the political systems of tyrannies and political attacks by tyrannies on democracy looking at Nazi Germany's efforts to subvert the United Kingdom, by looking at the efforts of the Soviet Union to interfere in West German politics in the 1970s and 1980s, but also looking at the American effort in Poland in the 1970s to support solidarity. Uh, I don't know what the truth is, uh, I, but I think the question you raised, the real question you raised, who would be better off if both sides engaged in an all out war of subversion is one which uh, uh, I think is amenable 
do empirical study. We, 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 can, we can actually look. And before embarking on this course of action, we should study this carefully and look at uh, the current situation because history teaches us some things, but always the current situation is, is not the same as history. So we have to look at what we actually face now. So excellent question. I'm very glad that you raised it. Thank you. Okay, Hanson, you may unmute yourself. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Professor Rosen. Um, I'd like to ask, a, in a way, a follow-up question and a clarifying question on Professor Hankin's point on, and your point on the importance of regime uh, in uh, devising foreign policy. Of course, uh, and the argument for a sort of realism is that it, uh, and, and the prudential approach that, that you alluded to, uh, is precisely that it disregards or that it doesn't really follow a strict discipline of um, tending to and being overly morally aware of being constrained by regime types so that you know we can build alliances that cut across regime types. Uh, but then there is this continuing persistent concern for regime types and as you just uh, you just said I mean the, the, the distinction between the tyranny and the democracy is one that is important to you and your uh, vision for what a U.S. foreign policy uh, would be like. Um, is that, um, it, how important is, uh, is regime type and how clear cut is regime type? Of course, you talked about India as, you know, uh, India is still, uh, it, it is the largest democracy in the world. But of course, if you, um, if you imagine a China sufficiently tamed, um, and if you can imagine a, an, uh, an Hindu, an Hindutva, a version of India that repeatedly does what it does in Kashmir at the moment. And if you imagine an increasing authoritarian uh, parliamentary constitutional democracy in India and an increasingly pacifist China, at what point does this kind of re strict regime type distinction sort of lose its meaning? And uh, I mean, are we going to support, I mean, there are, there are kinds of theocracies that we support, there are all kinds of tyrannies that we you have to support for different various reasons. And there are various reasons to also to, to think of non-democracies as you know, having elements that uh, we can uh, you know, find common grounds with. So if the, if the point is to return to what values we embrace and what values we hold to be worthy, then um, how do we judge if a foreign regime or a you know, potential collaborator or enemy is worthy of uh, a US commitment? And you know, are we going to have this kind of strict moralist reading of regimes as they are? Again, thank you very much. It's an excellent question. Uh, again, and I'll try to give uh, a two part answer. Uh, the first answer takes up your challenge to take seriously realist uh, calculations and thinking, which is what is realism focused on? Realism focuses on power not regime type, it focuses on power. A realist approach uh, would look at the competition between the United States and China. And it might come to the conclusion that I alluded to in my talk, which is China may be more powerful than the United States. A realist would then say, how would an inferior, a weaker state compete with a stronger state? A realist would say, in that situation, the weaker power must take advantage of the weaknesses of its adversary. In the case of China, as it is currently constituted, I would argue it's conceivable that the biggest weakness that the Communist Party of China has is its internal lack of internal legitimacy, uh, is, the, is the nature of its relationship to the people of China. So therefore, the suggestion that we consider the use of political warfare against China is driven by a realist assessment. We do it not because it's more moral, we do it because we have to, because we are weaker. If we were stronger, we might not have to. Uh, just as in the case of the competition with the Soviet Union, it was largely a competition of material force, a realist competition, in which, as you correctly point out, we allied with dictatorships as well as democracies. Uh, it may not be possible to compete with, that, with China because of its power without taking advantage of or exploiting in some ways its internal weaknesses. That's the first part of the answer. Second part of the answer is regime type is not for forever. Countries 
change gradually, suddenly. Countries have revolutions. Uh, in uh, the 20th century, uh, France has had uh, uh, coup d'etats uh, and close to military dictatorships. Um, so countries that now seem friendly and morally uh, compatible with us might change. And you, you make reference to India. Uh, I have worked with people who've got dug deeply into current Hindu nationalism, and it's not very pretty. Uh, it uh, has xenophobic, anti-American characteristics. So a, uh, it's not just Kashmir, it's the treatment of Islamic peoples within India which I think will be the major test of whether India maintains itself as a liberal uh, republic or not. The answer to that, and, the, uh, and China itself might evolve and uh, might become uh, more democratic. A realist would say a democratic China is just as much of a threat as a tyrannical China. Well, then a realist, which, who concentrates only on power would say, therefore, if Chinese power is the problem and changing Chinese, China's political system won't alter Chinese power, may make Chinese power greater, then a realist would be driven to the conclusion the objective of the United States should be to break China up into many competing nations. China is strong because China is united. Well, we must break China up into pieces, which is, by the way, what the CCP says the United States wants to do. We are supporting Taiwanese independence because what we ultimately want to do is, 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 to, is to foment uh, vociferous tendencies in all of the provinces of China. Taiwan is one province. If one province can revolt, why can't other provinces? Xinjiang and Tibet are the most obvious ones, but not the only ones. There are um, the Mongolian republics. There are the Manchurian ones. China is a multinational empire. The Chinese Communist Party knows that <clears throat> uh, and therefore is worried about it. Well, again, I would say as a realist that this multinational imperial character of China may be a weakness. And if the United States is weaker than China, it is a weakness that we might want to think about exploiting. Then the, then the issues raised earlier by Jim will come to the front. Is there a reciprocal vulnerability of the United States? Are we more vulnerable than China? Ought we not to do it as a matter of prudence? Prudence is a matter of experience. That is to say, it's a matter of data, uh, and we should explore that data. But again, the question that you raise is, is excellent. Regime type uh, is fluid. Uh, regime type can change. Uh, and strategic necessity may lead you to ignore regime type. But as I said, the, the, the paradox is, Realism of the kind that you suggest we consider seriously makes you think even more seriously about exploiting Chinese internal vulnerabilities. Thank you, Lior. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve, thanks for that talk. It was uh, very clear and clarifying, I found it. Um, uh, so thank you. Um, the question I have, actually, I'm, I'm a, a postdoc at the protocol on constitutional government this year. Um, um, the question I have is about technology and you mentioned it um, a few times in your talk, um, but I'm wondering if it calls into question kind of the basic premise that you're trying to advance, which is that we have the, the choice between these two kind of big alternatives um, in ways that, that uh, maybe I'll, I'll try to bring out. Um, you know, one can envision fairly soon a situation in which uh, kind of through drone technologies, both in the air and on the ground, you can achieve um, a fair amount of your strategic objectives with very minimal, um, as they say, boots on the ground, very minimal presence of American um, both forces and um, support for forces. So, you know, just to take two, two examples of this, one would be Fatah, right? The region in Pakistan from where a lot of the uh, Taliban um, fighters were trained and kind of uh, fled it, uh, um, flooded into Afghanistan. Um, President Obama vowed to, um, or at least during his administration, he wanted to start pulling back troops, pulling back American presence from Afghanistan. Um, but at the same time, he, as everybody knows, he stepped up the war drone. And it seems to me that those two things go hand in hand, or at least can go hand in hand. 
Um, another example would be cyber warfare, which you mentioned. Uh, I mean, cyber warfare is a, is a very interesting example because the, the consequences of it are material. I mean, you could cause material damage in the same way that you could from by releasing a bomb from a, from a bomber um, uh, through cyber warfare. Now, so the question is, you know, at some point, these two kinds of, of, of tactics become, um, you know, you can cast them as projecting power abroad or you can cast them as um, retrenchment. Um, they can go either way. It's, it's not very clear cut. And so I wonder if over time, as our technology becomes more advanced, over time, the, uh, this debate between do we send troops abroad or do we defend ourselves from here becomes irrelevant um, because, you know, kind of foreign policy and national security is just given over to technocratic oversight. Um, and so absent this moral, this clear moral choice that, that American citizens face between these two options, they become less engaged. Um, and that, of course, is going to have a lot of uh, consequences for the nature of our regime and, and civic spirit and all the things that you were getting at. So I was wondering if you could address kind of the technology question in a little bit more, uh, more detail. Thank you. Sure. It's, uh, again, a very good question. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll try to give uh, an answer which has uh, at least two parts. I may think of more parts as I go along. The first is I discussed technology not as something that determined policy, but something which conditions policy. Policies have to take account of reality. Technological capabilities are, are real and they, they uh, have to be taken into consideration. But the basic point I want to make in this part of my answer is the capabilities that you mentioned, unmanned military systems and cyber warfare, could be used either to fight abroad or could be used to fight to defend the United States. The ways in which the technology are used are not determined by the nature of the technology. So we, as, as you point out, we are using and have been using unmanned military technology to conduct warfare at long distances from the United States more easily because it doesn't involve soldiers and, and cells getting, putting themselves in harm's way. Therefore, it's politically easier. Uh, we can also use unmanned warfare better to defend the United States. Uh, in the way that China has. Uh, we, can, we can make sure that the areas in the Western Hemisphere are covered with drones and other kinds of unmanned vehicles to make it hard for anybody to come and bother us. Uh, it's already hard to bother us, but the people are trying. There is, as I said, uh, active programs now to protect the United States against, uh, to prepare to protect the United States against attacks by long range weapons, which other states are getting. So, but the basic point is technology affects how you do things, but it does not tell you uh, what you will do. Uh, on cyber uh, warfare, just one parenthetical note, the first use of cyber warfare that I'm aware of was by the United States against the Soviet Union in 1982. We gave the Soviet Union bad software for the gas turbine pumping technology, which they bought from West Germany, which led to a buildup of overpressure and the explosion of the pumping station, which produced a two kiloton uh, TNT e equivalent explosion, the largest non-nuclear explosion recorded uh, in modern history uh, in the Northern Soviet Union. So cyber warfare can blow things up, you're absolutely right. But whether or not you use cyber warfare to go on the offense abroad or to defend yourself at home uh, 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 is, is still a matter of choice. It may be driven by other realities, demographic realities, if the United States has one fourth of the number of people that China does, we better find ways of making each of our soldiers more effective because one on one, uh, we are facing a losing proposition. Uh, so technology, uh, I think, has to be used to augment the capabilities of, of our personnel, no matter what. Okay. Second point, will technology replace manned fighters, combatants? And, it's, and make it thereby, as you said, totally disinvolving the American people from the conduct of war by making it purely a matter of machines. No one who writes about this subject that I know of uh, thinks that this will happen. Why? Uh, all modern warfare uh, is effective because it combines different modes of warfare so that they complement each other. 
each form of warfare has its vulnerability. Tanks aren't bulletproof, but tanks are not so good at being aware of what's going on around them and therefore are vulnerable to infantry. So you put infantry to protect the tanks. Infantry can be shot at by the adversary. Well, you have to stop the adversary from shooting at the infantry. Artillery stops the adversary. This is called combined arms warfare. No weapon, no way of fighting is perfect. Solves all the problems. You have to combine them. Cyber warfare, unmanned vehicle warfare, uh, is thought of as one tool among many tools, each of which is necessary to accomplish the mission. The big weakness of unmanned warfare uh, is that machines and algorithms uh, have less intellectual independence, have less, cre uh, have less ability to adapt to unforeseen situations that a human being does. Uh, so the plan now is to combine manned and unmanned capabilities together so that the unmanned uh, uh, system does the things that unmanned systems are good at doing. Difficult, repetitive uh, activities under the guidance of a manned system, which is there uh, to provide human cognition, which will require and call for the participation of America. Uh, so uh, I will, uh, warfare become simply a war of the machines. Uh, not under current uh, understandings of technology present or projected into the future. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's an honest answer to your question, although not, it may not be completely satisfactory. Thank you. Rory, you're up. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Rosen, for your talk. Uh, you, you spoke in broad terms, which I very much like. Um, maybe you'll permit me to ask a question in broad terms or to put a topic on the agenda for you to reply to. And that's American decline. Um, I, I don't know if it's fair to say, but it certainly was a sense I had during the Obama administration that uh, foreign policy elites or Obama himself were both thought of themselves as managing American decline prudently. And you can see this also in sort of public intellectuals writings on the subject, people like Fareed Zakaria writing on After America. And you know, maybe that's not fully fair or accurate, but that was a strong sense I got, particularly, for example, in Obama's discussion of American exceptionalism or the lack thereof in his address to the United Nations. And I guess I would just add to this idea of managed or responsible decline that it, I think it was sanguine in part because of a presumption of what Obama called the arc of history, which I guess he thought somehow was bending towards liberal, capitalist, democratic, egalitarian justice everywhere, although he could, he and his party or America could contribute to. And I wonder if one can characterize our present situation as a situation of that managed decline is still the, in some sense, a dominant uh, undertone in American foreign policy amongst elites, although perhaps it's not usually declared, but the sanguine expectations of a, of a, of a stable international liberal capitalist global order are gone. And that the, the establishment so-called of Obama is just one member, they presumed wrongly that China would uh, liberalize uh, the, politically as, as, as it economically expanded and they were wrong and that, that that presumption was the basis of their view of, of how to, again, manage this decline. So I just put that kind of general gloss for your scrutiny, and I, and I asked the question, you know, is it, is it true that America should be seen as in decline? It's certainly in relative decline since versus 1989, when it was the un, undisputed absolute uh, hegemon, so to speak. That's true. But I mean, it just versus China, you, I, even from your own sort of tone, one senses a kind of feeling that parity at a minimum is what we can expect. But you know, it's possible to put it the other way maybe and say, no, I mean, this is sort of a choice that technology will drive the fundamental balance of power between China and the West. And the and technology is not a, it's not a done deal. We don't know what will happen. So yeah, on, on those notes, thanks. Sorry for the long question. No, 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 again, excellent question. It's one of which my friend Bill Crystal and I have gone back and forth on because we both lived through the 1970s and the 1980s when all the wise heads 
also were saying America was in decline. And Henry Kissinger saying his job was to manage, get the best possible deal he could from the Soviet Union because the United States was ultimately going down and, and we couldn't uh, take care of ourselves or do what we wanted to, which turned out to be totally wrong. Uh, the formative experience of my political years was Ronald Reagan came around and revived both the American economy, American military power, and American um, uh, confidence in itself. So it made it seem as if decline was a matter of choice, as you put it, uh, not just technology, but leadership. Leadership can reverse decline. Uh, is, that what, uh, is that the situation now? And this is where um, Bill and I have had, had some discussions. I, I don't think it's quite the same. Uh, I, with the kinds of policies that China currently has, uh, the Chinese economy will grow more slowly than it has in the past, but more rapidly than that of the United States. And so the economic decline measured strictly in terms of economic power appears to be a fact, both looking retrospectively and projecting out to the future. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, trends in, in relative capa economic capabilities. Uh, but I refuse to adopt the position that therefore the, 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 uh, the uh, proper policy for the United States is to manage decline. Because even though we are at a disadvantage uh, in absolute economic power, we have powerful and perhaps growing advantages in other areas. So we're not in decline in other areas we're facing a position of superiority, which may be increasing. Uh, <coughs> you mentioned technology, I refer to technology and I refer to China as uh, uh, stealing American technology and thereby getting close to the level of American technology. It still remains the case that American technological innovation is much more rapid than that of China. The usual statistics about the numbers of patents filed are, uh, have been repeatedly shown to be bogus. The Chinese pump up their no numbers by filing, filing repetitive or, or not, uh, not, not uh, sub substantially meaningful patents to make their numbers look better. Uh, but the Chinese look at us and they see SpaceX and they say, oh my God, you know, we've been trying to catch up in the old space launch vehicles and now the Americans have gone and invented a new space launch capability and not even the government, the private sector did it. Uh, the Chinese built this very extensive, very uh, 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 capable system of anti-axis with all these, but they built that on the technology of the 1980s. And the United States is building capabilities based on the technologies of the 21st century, which, you know, have a fair shot at beating those Chinese technology, uh, those Chinese anti-axis technologies. So we may have a sustainable lead in technological innovation, uh, which I, again, I implicitly refer to when I talk about the things the United States military is actually doing now. Can we sustain that lead? Can the Chinese steal our stuff faster than we can build it? Well, that's an interesting question. But I think it's also possible that we have a sustainable lead in attracting the talent that generates the technology. The test case that everybody's looking at now is Hong Kong. China can take Hong Kong and subdue it by force. They're in the middle of doing it. But what if all the smart people leave Hong Kong and go to Canada, the United States, or Australia? Well, then China loses the race for new capabilities. We saw that in the case of Nazi Germany and to some extent in the case of the Soviet Union. But the idea that the United States is in decline is, it should not be accepted because it's based on one measure and one measure only of national power, which is national economics, which matters. You know, economics can't be ignored and it's a factor which will constrain us. But there are other areas in which we may uh, be able to sustain or increase our advantage if we think about it as an area of advantage which has to be maintained. Uh, finally, uh, I think this is the point that you were really focusing on. Uh, the future is what we make of it to some extent. It's, 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 the, the future is contingent on our decisions. I think a lot of the people who argue about American decline want to preemptively end the American competition with China. 
It's like, it's hopeless. Give up now. Whereas people like me, perhaps like you saying, it's not clear that it's over, but it is over if we give up. Why don't we try to compete and then we can see whether or not we can sustain or not. It will be difficult. It, I, I said, I think China will be a more difficult nation with which to compete than the Soviet Union was. Uh, but that doesn't mean we cannot win. But if we give up, we certainly won't win. James Schlesinger, who was one of my heroes, was Secretary of Defense at the same time Kissinger was Secretary of State. He said, my job is to encourage the United States to believe in itself so that it tries to win. And he was the guy who was in the Secretary of Defense position at the time when the big effort was made to develop all of these new dramatic precision strike technologies. It happened because he helped make it happen. So I think your basic point, which is the future is contingent and dependent on what we decide to do, is something which I very much agree with. But we cannot ignore realities. That's why the, this, this lecture is called necessity and choice. There are some things that we must face that are real. We can't wish them away, but we still have the ability to choose given our, the necessities that we face. Thank you. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, which concrete policies of the current administration would you rate as promising or prudent or successful and which as highly um, imprudent or unsuccessful? The policies that I identified, which are largely the product of the American technology development system, not the result of the initiatives of President Trump, are the ones which have been quite successful. Uh, we are now in the process of developing and fielding systems <clears throat> that will make the existing Chinese anti-access area denial capability uh, much, much less effective. So I think on the military side, I think we've done uh, better than I, than I thought we would five years ago. Technology is something America is good at. Whether, whether a Republican is president or a Democrat is president, we, we, just, we, we pump it out. Uh, we have not done so well, uh, and, we, and we've also done well in our relationship with Japan and with India. It's not that just that the technology. Uh, the American defense relationship with Japan is much more extensive and intensive than it was uh, 10 years ago. It began to some extent under Obama, but it certainly has been con continued by Trump. And the, Japan is doing things now that we would not imagine to have been possible. 10 years ago, with American approval, in some cases, American assistance. American relations with India, which began to improve under Obama, uh, uh, continue to improve under Trump. By the way, the recent activities of the Trump administration with regard to Taiwan are regarded as being positive. Ending strategic ambiguity, making it clear that if Taiwan is attacked, the United States will come to Taiwan's aid, and we will supply weapons to Taiwan, which will make it better able to defend itself. Uh, the area where the United States has done less well, it clearly is, is in its relations uh, with uh, Europe. <clears throat> uh, President Trump, in my opinion, has unnecessarily offended, alienated, and otherwise uh, 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 injured our European allies in ways which make them less useful to us. The skeptic, however, might say, uh, Europe was not doing as much as it should before Donald Trump went on a tirade against it. Uh, the tirade was necessary because otherwise the, the Germans in particular would continue their unwillingness to commit any serious amount of money to their own national defense. And the question that he asked, which I think is legitimate and which was kind of the input, if the Germans aren't willing to spend money to defend themselves, why should the Americans be willing to defend, spend money to defend Germany? Uh, so I think President Trump uh, did, did, did not do as much as he could to build a relationship with Europe. But in his defense, the Europeans may have needed a sharp shock to get them to take seriously the fact that they had to start thinking about taking care of themselves. Thank you. We have uh, room for one last question. So, Joe, why don't you go for it? Sure. Uh, thanks very much. Just to pick up on a thread uh, around how the military is responding, I'm curious if you've followed uh, General, and I have to, of course, ask a question about the Marine Corps, but uh, I'm curious if you've followed General Berger's uh, planning guidance from last year, 
yes. which has been heralded as pretty innovative and unusually innovative, I guess, among yes. senior military leaders. Um, people like Chris mm -hmm. Rose have praised it effusively. And I'm curious what, if you're bullish about how, you know, whether that will be implemented adequately, whether it goes far enough, whether the sort of industrial complex will will put a stop to it or congressional leaders will um, not sort of go far enough in making some of the necessary changes to counter China and others. Uh, hey, Joe, it's good to see you. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, let me give a shout out to the Marines. The Marine Corps were one of the most innovative military organizations in the 1930s, uh, and I think they are now. Uh, the question, as you put it, as you mentioned, is whether the Commandant's initiative will be sustained. For those of you who are not familiar with this, the Commandant came in. In fact, he began preparing this before he entered office. Uh, he got people running step position papers before he was sworn in. And basically, his position was, everything the Marines do is up for grabs. Nothing that we do now is necessarily what we should be doing in the future. He got rid of all of the tanks in the Marine Corps. Said, There's just no way that we need the, we should be using them now. And he's calling for and is building a fundamentally new kind of littoral warfare capability, which is leverages the Marine Corps' ability rapidly to deploy to unprepared areas to, to enable them to gain strategic leverage on the Chinese by equipping them with long range strike weapons, uh, which will be based in these pop up areas. Um, and then ensure the survivability of these forces by moving them out quickly so they can't be fixed and targeted. Um, I think it is probably the most admirable effort by all of the services uh, to deal with the emerging realities. Close behind that, I would put the Air Force. The Chief of Staff of the Air Force saying, you know what, when the, when, when the war starts, the United States is going to be under attack. It was a fundamental revolution. Uh, and was necessary. Uh, and so the Air Force uh, and the Air Force's commitment, which again, you know, may not be sustained to unmanned systems uh, is, uh, is commendable. Uh, the Navy has been, has put some effort into it, has been slower, but appears now to be on the right track, at least as far as we can see. The Army has had the hardest problem, not because it's slow, but because the Army was fighting wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and he said, we can't think about the future. We still have wars to fight on the ground. And so uh, uh, we don't have the luxury to uh, commit resources to thinking about the future. That's changed. Uh, and they're beginning to think in, in, in very useful ways now. I'm, I'm bullish on, on the American military. I think they've done a, once they were told, look, the job is dealing with a major great power military competitor. They said, we know how to do that. That's what we're good at doing. We're not good at fighting insurgents. We don't like it. We don't want to do it. But fighting another great power, that's what we know how to do. And the full might of the uh, defense establishment shifted to doing that. Uh, I think it's, it's odds are that, that the Marine Corps will pull it off. The Navy, it's, it's more up for grabs. Uh, so, but it's good to see you. And uh, I, 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 I applaud your effort to... Uh, 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 to to reward the Marines for doing something very difficult. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have to stop, but I want to thank Steve Rosen. Everyone sees now what I said, that what I said about wiser heads uh, is true. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. It's off mute. I just, it was just wonderful, Professor Rosen. Thank you so much. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing all of you in person before not too long.